who you say that I am? When we read that first theme scripture, and Jesus asked Peter, or actually he asked all of them, but Peter was the one who came up with the answer. Readily he had it. And he told him, he said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. It was the Spirit of God who revealed it to him. And the same it is for us today. We accept it. If we have accepted that, it's the Spirit of God that reveals it. Some people accept it blindly. Some people give no thought to it. They just accept it. But it is important to have a revelation of it. We live in a country where there is no real persecution. I'm speaking in a very broad paint stroke manner. We don't have any persecution. We don't have anybody throwing us against the wall, threatening our lives. So what we believe about God and Jesus and the Father, the Trinity, the whole thing has not truly been tested for most. I don't know what goes on in your personal life. I don't know what your past is, but I think I might be kind of close to the truth on that. The apostles had to. Peter spoke up and it's good that it was Peter because look at all that Peter did. Look at what some might consider to be such a knucklehead, such a carnal man, such a fleshly person. But yet even he was able to get the revelation and be the first one to get those words out of his mouth and say, you are the son of God. You are the living Christ. You are the Messiah. It gives me hope. The apostles, why is it so important? Who do you say that I am? Why was it so important that they understood who Jesus Christ truly was? It's because they had to get it right. Jesus wanted to know that they understood this. He wanted to hear it. He didn't want to just discern and be able to look into their hearts, which he well could. But he wanted to hear it out of their mouth. He wanted it to be a confession. This is and was a foundational truth in that very moment of time. Peter reiterated what Jesus had been teaching all along, that he was and is the Messiah, that he was and is God, that in the end he was going to leave because of one last final sacrifice for the Jews. But the thing is, it wasn't just for the Jews. It was for also the Gentiles. It was going to happen one more time. And after that, he was going to be raised from the dead. And his resurrection was not going to be anything more or less than the trophy and the proof that he is who he said he is. He was who he said he was. If they got it wrong about who Jesus is, everything else on top of it would crumble. When Jesus was gone and he ascended into heaven, the apostles were still going to be here. And the apostles had to build on that foundation the, the, the doctrines that the church was going to believe. And it was so important that they got the foundation, the bottom, the concrete, if you will, what was going to be at the very bottom of everything else, because if that was not right and it could be pulled out from underneath the building, everything would shatter and fall and crumble to the ground. So who Jesus is, is a question that every believer must ask and be able to answer at some point in time. You have to get a revelation about who Jesus is. After Paul was admitted into his apostleship, he found the other apostles that they knew who Jesus was. That was early in Paul's conversion when he first to meet up with them. But even Paul, because he met Jesus, he knew who he was at that point. He couldn't explain everything yet. It was new. It was early in his faith. You can somewhat see a little bit of a progression in his knowledge and understanding when you read through the book of Acts. And then you start reading all the letters that Paul wrote. He didn't have it all together. He was, we know how educated he was. Scholars say it was like the equivalent, equivalent of having a minimum of two master's <coughs> degrees. In the things of the law. In the things of the law. The law of Moses. But when he found the other apostles, Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Matthew, and all the others, he found out that he wasn't the only one who knew Jesus, who Jesus was. They had to know because Jesus commissioned them to establish the doctrines, to establish what was in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what was in all the rest 
of the books of the New Testament. That was the foundation. That is the foundation that's on top of the, the, the bottom. That's on that truth. Why? Is it so important is what we're talking about. Who do other faiths and religions say that Jesus is? Most of the leading religions of the day admit that Jesus did exist, but they do not accept who he really is. Is it really enough to just admit that he exists? There's so many voices out there that say, what is the big deal? Why is Christianity such a hateful religion? Why is it such a hateful faith? Why do they exclude so many from the equation? It's not Christianity that's doing it. It's not our faith and what we believe in that's doing it. It's Jesus Christ himself who did it. It's God who did it. He excluded any other pathway, any other road, any other way that would try to lead up to that gate. There is only one way in. And there's only one way to go out and in and out. And that's through Jesus. That's through Jesus Christ. Is it really enough to just admit that Jesus exists? James 2, 19 through 20 says, You believe that there is one God. You do well. Let me read that again a little differently. I'm saying the same words, but I'm putting a little different tone in it. <clears throat> you believe that there is one God? You do well. The devils also believe and tremble. But will you know, O oh vain man, that faith without works is dead. Vain means hollow and empty, meaningless, aimless, and this is the real big one, fruitless. Fruitless. And that's what he's talking about. So many have misinterpreted that scripture to say that in order to be saved, you have to have works. In order, you, you, there's certain things that you just have to do in order to be saved. If you're going to stay saved, you have to have some works. And that might be true in one sense, that if your faith is in the blood of Jesus Christ and you truly have anchored it there, you will see works. But the works are not the qualifier. It's the faith and the object of the faith that is the qualifier. Judaism teaches in ancient Jewish writings that Jesus performed miracles by the power of Satan. They claim that Jesus was a false messiah that he died and he did not resurrect, that the gardener is the one who removed his body from the tomb. I don't know if you've heard of Ben Shapiro. Ben Shapiro is a conservative Jewish radio show host and analysis, political analysis. And being a Jew, he was done in an interview and he was asked, what do the Jews believe about the Messiah? What do the Jews believe about Jesus? And he said, the Jews believe that the Messiah will be a political figure who will appear and restore peace to Israel. Now think about that. Who does that sound like that they're being set up for? Exactly. The Antichrist. That's what it sounds like to me. Like Satan has deceived them up to that, to that extent to where they're just getting ready for the Antichrist. And Psalms 122, have you ever heard anyone in church say to pray for the peace of Jerusalem? It's very scriptural. Psalms 122.6 says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They will prosper that love thee. They that pray for Jerusalem will prosper. And the only reason they're going to pray for them is because they love God's people. We're God's people. But we're talking about Abraham's seed. We're talking about his first people. So we should pray for peace. But when I heard Ben Shapiro say that, someone who's so influential as he is in the Jewish community, and a very moral person, and very, very level-headed when it comes to conservatism and morals and doing what's right, it really gripped my heart. And when I pray for the peace in Jerusalem, I pray in just a different way. I pray that the Lord would prepare them for the truth and that they would not be so deceived. Yes. Islam teaches that Jesus was just a prophet, a Muslim. They teach that he was a Muslim and did not die on the cross. Hinduism teaches that Jesus was a holy man, a wise teacher, and a God. That he did not resurrect, but he reincarnated. The Jehovah Witnesses 
Now let me back up. Buddhism teaches that Jesus was enlightened. He was a wise teacher, but he was not God. Some believe that he is Buddha reincarnated. The Jehovah Witnesses teach that Jesus is pre-existed. And his form in heaven was Michael the Archangel. And that he has no power to save. The Mormons and the LDS, they teach that Jesus is Lucifer's brother and Jesus will save all whether they believe in him or not. Scientology teaches Jesus was not God and it is only fiction. 2 Corinthians 11, 3-4 says, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent deceived Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. That's what he's fearful of. He's fearful that we might bear with someone who comes and preaches another Jesus. Someone that would corrupt the simplicity that is in Christ. Someone that would come and preach something different than faith in the blood of Christ. For salvation and for sanctification. And so all these other religions and other faiths are preaching another Jesus. Interestingly enough, one of those cults that I just named is represented on my rig. And there's a Bible study that's conducted on a regular basis. I'm not able to go because it's on a different crew. But he attends every single one of them. And periodically he'll read from his false translation. And he'll pray with them. And he'll deposit with them. What do you do when you're in a work environment? It's not like you really have control over a situation like that. But it's just interesting how many open themselves up to him and receive what he has to say and have convinced themselves to believe that it's okay and it's no big deal, that he's a good guy and he just he's trying to fit in. It's important that we be firm in what we believe and what we know. Who did Jesus say he himself was? We talked about what false religions say. But who did Jesus say that he himself was? And why is that question so important? Who we believe Jesus is will determine our destiny. That's why it's important for us to know who Jesus said that he himself was. Because who we believe Jesus is, it will determine our destiny. It will determine eternity. John 14, 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. The Jesus that Jesus taught himself to be is the only way to the Father. Some would say this is too narrow-minded, too rigid, or too strict. Why so exclusive and conclusive saying something like that? It's because the right and wrong gate has a right and wrong way. I'm speaking about the way to get into the right gate. And I'm speaking about the way to get into the wrong gate. We must understand what it takes to get to the right gate that gets us in there. We must understand what is required. Proverbs 14, 12 and 16, 25. They both say, There is a way which seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. See, if we get the wrong way, we end up at the wrong gate. If we stay on the wrong road, the wrong path, you can be assured that you will go through the wrong gate. That's why. That's why it's so important that we understand who it is that Jesus said himself to be. Matthew 7, 13 through 15 and 24. Jesus says, enter you in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads to life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets. Therefore, I'm skipping down to verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man which built his house on a rock. 
and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on a rock. When he talks about entering at the straight gate and taking the narrow way, straight and narrow, it means crowded. And the reason it's crowded is because it's not wide. There's only so many people that can fit on it at one time in that exact spot on that road. The obstacle, there are many of them on that road. They're very close about. There's always things there to get you off the path, to get you off of that way. And the word way means mode or means. There is a way. There is a mode and there is a means to getting to that gate. And we understand the means to getting through the straight and narrow gate is simply through having our faith in the blood of Jesus Christ and what he did at the cross. It simply means that it's not very inclusive. It simply means that it is conclusive. There is no discussion necessary to work through it except just simply examining our hearts and making a decision who we're going to trust in. So if you look inside yourself and you look at the fruit of your life and you do not like what you see, it doesn't necessarily mean your faith is not in the blood of Christ. It may simply mean you need to persevere. It may simply mean that you need to keep going back to the cross. It may mean that you need to make multiple trips daily to the cross until you start to see some fruit, until you start to see something change. You have to nurture. You have to nurture the seed that's in your heart. You have to nurture it. You have to keep going back. There is a means. When these scriptures are preached or taught, it's always focused on the gate. It's always, have you noticed, it's always about the gate, the gate, the gate. And very little talking about the way, the way, the way. There is a way that leads to that gate. There is a way about you. There is a way about me. And it's leading somewhere. I'm talking about a lifestyle. I'm talking about the actions and the behaviors that are in our lives. They are leading us somewhere. And we have to self-examine constantly. Amen. I examine my thoughts more now than I ever have before. Because if you haven't noticed yet... We need to realize that our thoughts, everything, every action, everything that we do, every decision we make, it originates with a thought. And when those thoughts, whatever kind of lust it may be in your mind, it starts there. And it manifests if you ignore it. It will come back. It will manifest like a dead corpse that you push underwater. It will pop right back up to the surface. You cannot afford to ignore what Paul said to cast down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. I'm going to tell you what will destroy this church. I'm going to tell you not just not having faith in the right thing. That's not the only thing, okay? And God forbid if you take it wrong because that is so, it's, it's the most important thing. Uh, and it, I have to say, division. I have to say, malice. I have to say, disagreement to the point where fleshly Betsy and Carnal Arnold puts themselves in front of the overall purpose for this church. It will destroy. It will destroy everything here. If you've been dealt a blow and you don't agree with certain things, there is a proper way that it should be handled. There is a proper way that we should all conduct ourselves. And I can tell you, Satan himself and his kingdom of darkness is behind every ounce and every fiber of division that is in this church. And he is against it. And he wants us to come together in agreement. Amen. According to Psalms 133 where he says how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the oil that he poured down on Aaron's head and went down his beard, down to the edges of his garment. That oil represents the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. If you want the Holy Spirit to pour out in this place, you want to see a move of God in this church like you've never seen here before, I'm going to tell you how it will happen. We already have the right message. Now we just simply have to get along. 
Now we just simply have to submit ourselves one to another in unity. That is what's going to cause a revival of repentance in this church and go out into the street. And the revivals of the times past have always seemed to happen inside the four walls of the church. And I can tell you right now in this day and age, we're coming to a point to where it's not going to be in the church. It is going to be on the street. It's going to be in the neighborhood, at our jobs. It's going to be outside the four walls. And the very thing that Jesus said, that you shouldn't hide under a bushel, the light. He says you put it up on the top of a hill and you let it shine before the whole world. It means you can't be ashamed of it. It means you can't keep your mouth shut when there's something to say. But the church has become the bushel. We come in the four walls of a church, and I say we, the church in America. We come in the four walls, we shout, we sing, we preach, we teach, we jump, we dance, we clap our hands, we throw our hands in the air to worship the Lord, only so that when we leave, the light goes out. And we act like we don't even know him anymore when we're in the grocery store. We act like we don't even know him anymore when we're at the job. We act like we don't know him anymore when a guy comes on to us or a girl comes on to us. We act like we didn't even hear the message that was preached on Sunday or Wednesday. God wants us to get that light from underneath this bushel that we're in right now and shine it all around. And let people see it and let people feel it. It's the only way that God's going to use us. It's the only way. We have to take it. We have to get the shame out. We have to get the pride gone. And I don't mean this. I don't mean it to condemn. I really don't. The reason that I say it that way is because you've never seen a more prideful person. Someone who grew up in the church. Someone who had every reason not to be ashamed. And I would go to my jobs for 30 plus years. And be ashamed every single day and not say not one word when there was multiple, multiple opportunities to tell people about Jesus. And I struggled with it through the years I wrestled with it. And I thank God that I wrestled with it. I thank God that it bothered the dickens out of me. It made me feel so horrible to be so blessed to have the truth. And yet I hid it because I was ashamed of Jesus. And right now I can say that I'm not ashamed. Right now, I know I, I can say if they would give me the podium in our cinema on my rig, I would take it. I would take it. In less than, less than a tenth of a second, I would take it. God's moving. He's moving in my neighborhood. God's moving on my job. He's pouring out His Spirit. People are becoming born again. Christians are becoming unashamed. Cussing Christians are coming to understand that they really shouldn't be doing that. The struggle's real. I understand the struggle too. I mean, I just told you about pride. The struggle is so real. It's so, it's, it's right there. It's, it's not prejudice. The struggle's not prejudice. It's in everyone's life. But the thing is, we have to get real with ourselves. We have to be real with ourselves. We have to be real about who we are and what's, what's really inside of us. If we don't examine our hearts and we're too busy judging other people, too busy being angry and bitter 
over other people. We're too busy uh, trying to correct them that we're not able to, to address what's in us. God wants, God wants, God wants to use us. So the right and the wrong gate has a right and wrong way. John 3, 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. John 8, 23. And he said to them, You are from beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I said therefore to you, that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. He was giving them a promise. He was assuring them that if they did not believe Jesus, that he was who he was teaching and telling them he was, I promise you, it will happen. You will die in your sins. And they knew exactly what he was talking about. He didn't have to say the four letter word that starts with a big H. John eight twenty eight. Then said Jesus to them, when you have lifted up the son of man, then shall you know that I am he, John 8, 28. And that I do nothing by myself, or excuse me, I do nothing of myself. But as my father has taught me, I speak these things. Shall know who I am. They're going to know who I am. Jesus is? Who is he? He was just talking in that same chapter of chapter 8 and verse 12. He was talking about being the light of the world. He said, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. We have the light of life in us. So we have something that we can shine. It's a matter of dealing with pride. It's a matter of dealing with shame. He will deal with it. He will remove it. He will. And I'm not going to lie to you. It is very scary. At least it was for me to step out the first time. And it was even awkward the first time. And I felt like an absolute fool the first time that I just stepped out and I just got uncomfortable with it and just decided I'm not. I am not going to be ashamed. I am not going to carry this pride. I'm just not going to do it. And then the next time I stepped out unashamedly. And then there was another time. And it got to the point to where it was more awkward not to speak than it was to speak. Yeah. And I started to see people respond. Lutherans. Catholics. Baptists. All kinds of different denominations represented, but they respond started to have conversations with self-proclaimed Christians. If you claim to be a Christian, then we got to talk about some of these things. we got to talk about it. We need to have conversations. And I've learned that if you don't go to somebody condemning, but you go to them in love, and you talk about some very controversial things that are in their life, but they know that you love them, and they know that you care for them, you can talk about some really sensitive stuff, and they'll open up to you. Because they know you love them. And they know that you're going to hold it in confidence. There was someone that I had a conversation with just before getting off the rig. Been talking to this guy for over a year now about Jesus. Trying to get him to come to a Bible study. And that was way back when the Lord showed me that, man, you need to get off the Bible study kick and just get on the Be My Witness, Shine Your Light kick. Get off yourself. Get off of your preconceived idea. There's going to be some that will go to a Bible study and there's going to be many, many more that won't. So figure it out, son. So that's when I started to make the cards and I hand out these cards to everybody. I just give them to everybody. I'm always giving it out. It has a little bit to do with my testimony. It's John 3.16. It gets a hold of everybody. Everybody knows John 3.16. I gave it to this one guy and he read it and as soon as he said, oh man, that's my father's favorite verse. And he's the one who stands up in our, in our pre-tower meetings every day before work. And he, he prays over the whole group that God would protect us and all this. And then he goes out into the field and whew, 
when he stands up to pray, many people just file right out of the door before he even gets to get a word out. Don't want to be there. Don't want to be around that. And it's not because they don't want to be around someone that prays. If you get what I'm saying. Just started to have a conversation with him for the first time. But getting back to the other guy. He told me, he said, Aaron, man, he said, he said, you give those cards out? Because I had said something about giving a card out at the grocery store. And he said, you give those things out at home? I said, well, yeah, man. A soul's a soul. It's people. They need Jesus, man. You need Jesus. I need Jesus. We need Jesus. Are you kidding me? I have to. He said, man, it scares me so much, man, when I read that scripture that talks about Jesus cursing the tree. He said he's going to curse that tree because it didn't bear any fruit. I said, it's true. He will. He did curse that fig tree. And the reason is because it did not bear fruit. And I said, man, don't be discouraged. God sees your heart and he knows that you want him. But you got to understand some things. If you don't understand some things, no matter how hard you try and your motives being all right, you won't get there if you don't understand some things. He said, man, I know I can't talk to people like you do. He said, I don't want Jesus to curse me. And all I can tell him is, man, you got to understand some things. God's going to make it happen for you. He sees your heart. He knows where you are. And thank God he judges the heart mm -hmm. before he judges the actions and the fruit. But I said, yeah, you do need to bear fruit. But look at the way you treat people. You're not like these, a lot of these other guys. There's fruit. It may not be the fruit that you want, and that's good. That's good. It's not what you, you want more. You have my respect because of the way you treat people. The way you speak to people. But then we, you know, we're talking about the cussing thing and, and he struggles with that. You know, it's the environment. He said, when I'm at home, I don't have a problem with that. I said, I understand. I understand. All I can tell him is you need to understand some things. And I tell him some of those things, but we only have so much time, you know, to talk. Got to go to work. So the Lord's dealing with different people. And God wants to use you in a greater way than even that. God wants to. He wants us to shine our light. John 8, 12. He says, I am the light of the world. Verse 21. He says that they should seek God. Because Jesus is God. He told them in verse 21 of chapter 8 of John. He says, then said Jesus again to them, I go my way and you will seek me. And will die in your sins. Where I go, you cannot come. You got to read between the lines there. Look at what he's telling them. I go my way and you will seek me. I'm going. I'm going somewhere else where you can't go. And you're going to seek me. And this is the, this, this is the devastating part. You're going to seek me and you're still going to die in your sins. And what he's saying is because I'm going somewhere that you're not going because the road, the way that I'm on, you're not on that way. You've already rejected me. You've already settled it out in your heart that I am not the Messiah, that I am not the Christ, that I'm not God. And this is what you don't realize. So you might be sitting there, well, wait a minute. How are they going to seek Jesus? That's not exactly what he's saying. You're going to seek me. You're going to seek God is what, they're, what he's saying. You're going to go and you're going to seek God, but you won't accept I am God. I, God is here, man. God is here. It's what I've been trying to tell you. But you don't get it. So when I'm gone and I ascend into heaven, you're going to be down here seeking me who you don't even realize it's me. And you're going to end up dying in your sins and it's going to be an eternity of regret behind you. See, this is who Jesus is. He declared, again, he, he would not just lay it down and make it too easy 
to just readily understand. He wants people to seek him. He wants people to run after him, to pursue him, to understand and find out who he is for themselves. Not riding or hanging on to the coattails of parents, employers, employees, or whoever or whatever. But to get to know God for yourself. And then he says in John 12, okay, we read two other verses and this is the third one where he uses the same expression. He says, and if I be lifted up, in this one he says, from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. This he said signifying, see here's the explanation. What does it mean when he says, if I be lifted up? This he said signifying what death he should die. See, what draws men to God, and look, I believe, I believe it, I do. I believe that when we praise God and we lift up His name, I believe it draws people because the presence of God comes. Okay? But, I, but I'm just talking context here. In this particular context, in all three instances where He talks about Jesus, He says, if I be lifted up, if I be lifted up, He's talking about the death that He would die. Jesus had to go up on that cross and come down. And his flesh just <clears throat> on those nails. It had to happen. And he had to breathe his last breath. It had to happen. He had to die. It had to happen. It was the only way that the Father would draw men. Remember, he says somewhere else, no man can come unto the Father unless he draw them. And how does he do that? It's through the cross. That is why we have to preach the message of the cross. That is why it is so critical and so important. John 8, 58, he says, Before Abraham was, I am. That is to say, I always have been. This is Aaron speaking. That is to say, I always have been before the beginning of time, as we talked about earlier. Exodus three fourteen is where that originates in Scripture. He Moses asked God, he said, God, what am I going to tell the children of Israel when I go to them? They're going to ask, who is it that sent you? You know, what, where is this message coming from? And you, Moses, the Egyptian, the Jewish Egyptian. <laughs> and this is what God told him. You tell them I am that I am. That's who. And then he said again. I am has sent you. Matthew 27, 11, The king of the Jews. That's what Pilate asked him. Are you the king of the Jews? And how does he answer? You said it. You said it. What you said. John 6. He calls himself the bread of life. In that same chapter later on, he said some really, really strong things. In awkward words, he said, eat my flesh or drink my blood or get the get out of my sight. That's my version. <laughs> he said, eat my flesh or drink my blood or you have no part of me. You have no part. And to me, that's what he's saying. Eat my flesh and drink my blood or get out of my sight. And that's exactly what the majority of them did. And the only ones that were left were his twelve. They were the only disciples, the only followers that stood there. So there needs to be an explanation about eating my flesh and drinking my blood. He was talking the whole, the whole time, every day, day in and day out. He's preaching faith. He's preaching faith. He's preaching it. He's teaching it. He's breaking it down. He's talking about the kingdom of God. He's talking about having faith. Your faith must feed on his flesh and his blood, his sacrifice, the cross. He's preaching. He's talking about the cross. And he qualifies. He qualifies there when he says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. It's not very many verses later. He qualifies and says that he was talking in the spirit. His words are spirit and life. He makes it very clear. His words are spirit and and life. It was a spiritual thing he was talking about, not a physical thing. He didn't want anybody to walk up to him, grab an arm, and take a bite. <laughs> he wasn't talking about the elements of communion, 
literally being the flesh of Christ and literally being the blood. That's not what he was talking about. It's very clear if you read the whole chapter and you pay very close attention to the every word. John 8, 12, he calls himself the light of the world. John 10, 7, he calls himself the door of the sheep. He says, by me, if any man enters, he shall be saved. He'll go in and out and he'll have pasture. It means he'll have food. His faith will be strong. His faith will be strengthened when it becomes weak. John eleven twenty five. 25, he calls himself the resurrection and the life. Lazarus was overcome by death, but death never overcame Jesus. Jesus gave up his life to death. Death didn't overcome him, but rather he overcame death so that we could have eternal life. Psalm 1610, David says, David says that God would not allow the Holy One to see corruption. Acts 2, 27 and 31. Peter quotes David there and says, his soul is not left in hell. Talking about Jesus. Quoting David, but talking about Jesus. His soul was not left in hell, nor his flesh would see corruption. I'm going somewhere. Acts 13, 35 through 36. All right, David said it. Peter quoted David saying it. And now Paul's quoting David saying it. Paul quotes David. He says that God would not allow the Holy One to see corruption. There's something important here that it has to be communicated. I mean, almost identically, almost verbatim, all three times. He's talking about the resurrection. He's talking about when Jesus died. This concept right here that I'm about to explain, and you, I'm sure some of you already fully understand it, but this concept right here completely blows the Jesus died spiritually doctrine. Not out of the water. Not out of the ballpark. I'm talking about out of this universe. I'm talking the speed of light, gone. Jesus could not have become a sinner because there's no way that he or his flesh could see corruption. Corruption means moral, this is what it means, moral and physical destruction. Moral, which leans toward the spiritual side, and physical, which is the flesh, his body, destruction. Jesus did not experience this so-called Jesus died spiritually, false doctrine. Sin was laid on him but sin never entered him. Jesus was a sin offering. Nothing more and nothing less. Jesus took our sin and he carried it to the cross. And he died and paid the penalty for it. And so it is important, not that we just believe in his death and his resurrection, but what we believe about his resurrection. John 10, 11 and 14 he talks about the good shepherd. He talks about the hireling. It's interesting. Jesus refers to himself as the good shepherd. We're talking about who Jesus said himself to be. He said, I am the good shepherd. And then he goes on to talk about the hireling who leaves the flock. Whereas the good shepherd stays with the flock. But the hireling is there for selfish benefit. The good shepherd is there for the sheep's benefit. This is me talking here. The hireling uses and abandons the sheep. The hireling's going to leave eventually. When he gets what he wants and he's done getting all he can get, he leaves. He abandons it. But the good shepherd stays and defends the sheep. You see, the first Adam is like that hireling. Just hang with me. I know this is a new concept probably. The first Adam is like that hireling. The last Adam, who we know to be Jesus, is the good shepherd. The first Adam had responsibilities in the Garden of Eden. He was to dress and to keep. That's what God told him. I want you to dress and to keep the garden. To keep means to guard, to keep watch, to ward off, to protect, and to save life. Did Adam protect? Because when that woman ate of that fruit, 
The Bible says after she ate, she gave it to Adam who was with her. And his responsibility was to guard, to protect, to keep, and to save life. And he could have saved her life. And the blame is more on him because Timothy says she was deceived. But Adam was not. Adam knew very well what she was doing. She was completely deceived by that slithery snake. And he, like a hireling, did not protect. He abandoned her in that moment of time. In fact, you know what he did? He made her a test subject. He watched her eat it first. A real man would have stepped up and said, no, if we're going to do this, let me take the first bite and let's see what happens. But he stood back like a hireling and said, let me see how it affects her. If she falls apart at the first bite, then I'm not taking a bite. I'm just thinking, okay? Yeah, it's ex he let her do it and he watched her. And when he saw that it seemed like everything was okay, then he took a bite. What a fool. What a jerk. <laughs> Man. I, I never saw that until today, actually. <laughs> saw it like that. The first Adam is like a hireling. The last Adam is the good shepherd. The first Adam used his bride. See, the hireling uses people, and then he abandons them. The good shepherd, he stays there for the long haul. And he protects. The first Adam used his bride. The last Adam defended, protected, and laid down his life for his bride. <laughs> the first Adam hid himself from God after he did what he did in sinning. Because of sin, he hid himself. The last Adam openly hung on a cross before God and before the whole world. Because of the sins of the world. Why did Jesus say he himself was who he was? Why is that question so important? Because who Jesus is, is the reason why his church will prevail rather than fail. Because of who he is, that's the reason that the church will prevail rather than fail. In our theme scripture, Matthew 16, and then going down to the last verse, 18, and we're going to go into 19. He says, and I, I say also to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. You see, the gates of hell represent the powers of Satan and his kingdom. I see that in more of a figurative sense, the gates of hell. I believe there's gates to hell, a literal gates. But I see this more as figurative, speaking of the powers of Satan and his kingdom. Ephesians 6.12 being a good example. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Man is under the power of hell because of the sin nature and because of the dark, fallen, angelic, and demonic entities that are at war. They are at war with our soul. Between those demonic and angelic entities from the side, the dark side, if you will, and because of our sin nature, we are, without Christ, we're under the power of the gates of hell. But he said that the gates of hell would not prevail against his church. Getting back to the unity. Getting back to division. Satan loves it. The devil loves it. Who did Jesus say he himself was and why is that question so important? In ancient times, the steward of a wealthy family, especially of the royal household, was given a key. It is believed that in such instances, it would be a golden key given in recognition of the person's office. It grew into an expression of raising such a person to great power. Jesus designated Peter as the one. He designated Peter 
He told Peter, he wasn't talking to all 12 when he said this part. He said, Peter, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. So he designated Peter as the one who at Pentecost would be the first to open the kingdom of heaven to a great crowd of Jews in Acts chapter 2. He was the first to preach that first message in which they would accept Christ and they would be converted and become born again. 3,000, I believe. And then eventually he went to Caesarea Maritime in which there was a group of Gentiles, Cornelius and his company in Acts chapter 10. Again, Peter, he had the keys. Jesus told him he had the keys. He preached the first message that brought in the first recorded souls in our scriptures. Is that not a great picture of forgiveness in Peter's life? Is that not a great picture, an example of forgiveness that's available to us? You see, God gave the keys. Jesus, God, gave the keys to Peter to unlock the kingdom. What was shut up for thousands of years, not Moses or Abraham, not David, not Noah, not Enoch, not Methuselah, none of those godly men, none of them were able to access the kingdom. None of them were able to offer the kingdom. They prophesied about it. They preached on it. They prayed about it, but they had no access because Jesus had not yet died. The one time, all time, superstar sacrifice had not yet come, but now it has come. And Peter was given those keys. He unlocks it for the Jews and the Gentiles, Jews, we know that, but Gentiles is anybody that's not a Jew. It includes everybody, regardless of the color of skin, regardless of the shape of your big head. It doesn't matter how tall or how short, if you're a whosoever, Jew or Gentile. He would give the, see, he gave the keys to Peter, but he would give the same power, not the keys, but the power of the kingdom of heaven to every believer. Every believer had and has the power. He gave the keys to Peter, but he gave the power to you and he gave the power to me. It is high time for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to stand up and say to the whole world who Jesus is. Jesus is calling out to you. Who do you say that I am? Say it. It's time to start saying it. Don't try to say it until you get the pride out the way if there is any. It's, it's, a, it's a real waste of time. It's best to be real with yourself. It's best to get alone with God and examine your heart for that. Acts 1.8, he says, But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And all of my time spent in the Scripture, I have not found any other place where he says this will happen when the Holy Ghost comes on you. I perceive that to mean the baptism in the Holy Ghost. I don't see, he says, you will speak in tongues. I don't see him say, you will prophesy. You will have a gift of healing. I don't see him saying that, although I believe that. I'm not saying I don't believe any of that, okay? I'm just saying this is the only place that I know of where in the Bible where Jesus says, or, or anyone, any person of God says that this will happen. When the Holy Ghost comes on you, when you're filled, when you're baptized in the Holy Ghost. Now we see what does happen. They speak in tongues. They prophesy. They operate in healing. They operate in all those 12 gifts of the Holy Spirit. I'd rather seek to be a witness, just to be honest with you, than to be filled with the whole, uh, uh, than to be speaking in tongues. I would rather be a witness. I would, and, and, and there's many of other denominations that don't believe in speaking in tongues. But I can tell you one thing. They are some powerful witnesses for Christ. That'll mess up your theology. That will really mess up your theology. I'm just telling you. But I don't, I don't back away from the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I want them and we need them. 
Samuel Clemen, Mark Twain. Y'all know Mark Twain? He attended a Sunday morning service. A sermon that was preached by a pastor. He met the pastor at the door afterward and told him that he had a book at home with every word he had preached that morning. The minister assured him that the sermon was an original. And Mr. Mark Twain, he still held his position. He's, the pastor wanted to see this book. So he said that he would send it over in the morning. And when the preacher unwrapped it, he found a dictionary. <laughs> and in the fly leaf was written this words, just words, just words. I hope to God I never have anything like that happen to me after I preach. <laughs> Romans, the point is this. There's power in the proclamation of the gospel. That's right. And there is no power in the gospel if it's never proclaimed. I have to be honest with you. It has to be proclaimed. It has right. to be said. It has to be told. It has to be taught. It has to be heralded. Romans 10, 13 through 15, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach. To preach is to herald. And a herald had a responsibility. And the typical herald back in the beginning of our nation, their primary responsibility was to warn and, and to declare war, to make sure everyone knew if there was a war that was breaking out. And how much more in the kingdom of God do we need to declare it? Do we need to preach it? Do people need to understand this war, this fight of faith, these principalities and powers that spiritually we need to wrestle with in prayer? <coughs> Let me tell you something about proclaiming the message. You don't need to stand behind one of these right here. You don't need one of these. You don't need a wooden pulpit to preach the gospel. I do it all the time on my job. You can let the Holy Spirit be your pulpit. You can stand behind Him. You can make your pulpit a desk on your job. You can make a pulpit a life jacket on a boat. You can make your pulpit a microphone. You can make a pulpit a pharmacy jacket. You can stand right behind that. You can make a pulpit a steering wheel going through a drive through You can make a pulpit a hammer and a nail gun. You can stand behind a clipboard and preach. You can stand behind scissors and a comb cutting somebody's hair. You can stand behind a chipping hammer, a needle gun, a propane and oxygen torch. You can stand behind a Freon tank. Come on. You can stand at the top of a scaffold and make that your platform to preach from. I'm telling you, if you've got Jesus and the Spirit of God lives inside of you and you've been redeemed, you have something.